There's a popular saying that the journey of a thousand miles often starts with a single step. And so it was for me as I crossed the desert, taking the last few steps and reaching the gates of the fabled city of Timbuktu. It has been one of my life's wishes to set foot in this oasis of learning ever since I first heard about Timbuktu. Like many travelers before me, I too have reached the gates of Timbuktu. Timbuktu the mysterious, Timbuktu the holder of secrets, Timbuktu the center of knowledge. The mythical city of Timbuktu is found at the edge of the Sahara Desert in the country of Mali. Today the desert is slowly encroaching on it. And upon entering the city, I was amazed to see how ancient it still appeared. I could only think of former explorers who journeyed across the Sahara to find Timbuktu. Some perished while others survived. The city was for centuries closed to non-Muslims and whosoever dared to venture inside its walls were quickly put to death. One of my first questions was to find out how the city was born. The meaning of Timbuktu depends on historians. According to some historians, Timbuktu came from Tin, which means in the local tongue, the Tuareg tongue, the well, and Buktu, that was the lady in charge of nomads' luggages, because when nomads are moving, they leave heavy luggages with that lady. Okay, and with the time, the place took the name of Tin Buktu. Timbuktu was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was a type of Shangri-La, or Atlantis, where people thought that there was a land beyond the deserts of the Sahara, where gold lined the streets, and people uh, put gold into their ceilings, and there were famous kings who would lavish their guests with gifts of all different types. And it was a type of sumptuous kingdom, where desert Bedouins would meet with the people of the rivers, and all types of travelers from different parts of the world would gather. Timbuktu became one of the most important southwestern um, capitals where they could send scholars, they could um, get information. Also, the Qurans that were being uh, written in Timbuktu were famous. The beautiful calligraphy, the golden calligraphy, and the type of script and the leather binding was famous. So it became a commercial center. And then later on, uh, it became an intellectual center because the scholars generally were traveling with the caravans and the knowledge was moving along with the caravans and so therefore it was a natural place for the scholars to reside so it's, it's a meeting place of agricultural people of nomadic people straight out desert people and, and scholars came from all of these groups so when you look at the history of Timbuktu you will see that the different groups uh, gave their scholarship at different points in history so Timbuktu has different phases uh, within its existence, and all of the groups participated uh, in the different phases of development. Even though Timbuktu has today lost its former glory, I was amazed at how the city has withstood the elements. The town center is filled with sights and sounds and colors, and the hustle and bustle remind you of modern cities throughout West Africa. The streets of Timbuktu hold many secrets. I was pleasantly surprised to find that the house of one of the greatest teachers in the history of Timbuktu is still in existence, Sheikh Mohammed Bagayugu, the teacher of Sheikh Ahmed Baba. We are blessed uh, here in the house of Sheikh Mohammed Bagayugu to be in the presence of one of his relatives. This is one of the great grandsons of the Sheikh, Sheikh Mahmoud Al Wangadi Al Bagayugu. And he is the Imam of, of the Masjid Sidi Yahya and a very important personality here in Timbuktu. As Altina Kelima Haula Sheikh Hayatuhu 
شيخ محمد بن غيوغو هو كان شيخا كبير وكان معلما للشيخ احمد باب السودان الذي اعطي اسمه لمركز احمد باب فهو قد سكن في هذا البيت فاصله من اليمن قيل انه كان في قريه صغيره لا توجد الان هذه القريه تسمى الونقريه فانطلق من الونقريه الى بلد يسمى قوم توجد الان في ساحل العاج كان في المال الكبير فمن القوم انطلق الى جنه للتجاره تجاره الذهب والكولا فهنا وصل جنه تزوج هناك ووجد ابنين احمد بغيوغو ومحمد بغيوغو اسمه محمود بغيوغو ووجد اسمي ولدين احمد بغيوغو ومحمد بغيوغو هما اتوا هنا في في تمبوكتو وسكنوا في هذا البيت وتوفي محمد بغيوغو في 1592 ودفن في يعني خارج مدينه تمبوكتو. نعم ما شاء الله. وهو كان عالما كبيرا كان عالما كبيرا كان يدرس في جامع سونكوري ايوه وكان اماما لمسجد سيداهيه ومن اجل ذلك نحن الان في الامامه في لمسجد سيداهيه وانا بالضبط اسمي محمود بغيوغو. ما شاء الله نعم الله يبارك فيك. وكان معلما للشيخ احمد بابا والشيخ من بابا ياتوا هنا للدرس وبعض الطلاب من من الجامعه ياتون الى الشيخ احمد بابا ويطلبون منه ان يعريني يعريهم يعني بعض الكتب ولا اسماء اسم اسماءهم هم يذهبون بالكتب ولا لا يرجون مع الكتب. مصاحف وتفاسير نعم نعم Ever since the first Egyptians discovered the art of writing on papyrus, man gains an efficient tool to record his history on earth. In time, the recording of history evolved into books of knowledge, and in Timbuktu, ancient texts can still be found. Libraries have been set up in the homes of families, and I was fortunate to be allowed access to it. One of the best kept secrets in the city of Timbuktu is right here in this house. The treasure chest of Sheikh Mohammed Bariyugu with his books um, is here, and our brother Sidi Mukhtar from his family uh, will open up this invaluable storehouse of knowledge. الكتب الموجودة في في المكتبة الآن تتناول جميع الكثير من الموضوع يعني هناك كتب بالنسبة لعلم الطب وهناك كتب للأحاديث وهناك كتب الفقه وكتب التوحيد والتفسير والبلاغة والمنطق والبيان ولكن نستطيع أن نقول أكثر الكتب في في المكتبة تتناول الفقه الإسلامي لأن كان تنبوكتو يعني منذ قديم الزمن الناس يهتمون بالفقه الاسلامي اكثر من الكتب العلوميه كالرياضيات والفيزياء والكيمياء وما اشبه ذلك. Muslims are known the world over for their hospitality and in Timbuktu it's no different. After studying the texts of Sheikh Bagayugu, I was invited to the home of Sheikh Mahmoud where he showed me some of the artifacts that belong to his this is from uh, Toledo, from Toledo. Antilope. 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 So it's ivory, and then it's your metal, and the horn of an antelope. The scholars of old were all learned men who pursued knowledge because of their love of Islam. Many of them were imams of mosques, and in Sheikh Mahmoud's case, this is no different. As a descendant of Sheikh Bagayugu, he is also the imam of Sidi Yahya Mosque. This is the masjid of Sidi Yahya. It was originally built in the 14th century by Sheikh Ibrahim Hamella of the famous Kunta clan. He had a dream that this masjid would be visited by a famous saint, a wali. And so he locked the masjid for 40 years. Then there came Sidi Yahya, 
at Tadlisi from Andalusia. At that point, Sheikh Ibrahim realized that this was the fulfillment of the dream. He opened up the masjid and this mosque has been serving the people of Timbuktu from the 14th century and it represents one of the most important areas of learning and prayer in the city of Timbuktu. After spending time in such esteemed company, I decided to walk to absorb all that I had seen and heard. I had barely walked a few meters when I stumbled upon the market. The electric atmosphere engulfed me. Before I knew it, I was drawn into Bata with one of the tradespeople. I couldn't help but imagine how alive and ancient this practice is. Timbuktu was a place where gold was traded for salt. It was a place where fine clothing, where leather goods, where all types of implements for living were traded by the people. I decided to remain in the marketplace and visit a few more stores. Down the dusty streets and alleyways, one can find amazing hidden treasures. I knew this from my previous travels to ancient cities, and it wasn't long before I stumbled upon a rare book by one of the great scholars from Fez in Morocco. The book was by Sidi Ahmed Zavouk, who did the commentary on the famous Maliki jurisprudence of Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd al Qaidawani. As I paged through the works of this Maliki scholar from Morocco, my mind wandered to another great scholar, Sheikh Ahmed Baba. Sheikh Ahmed Baba, who was taken prisoner from Timbuktu to Morocco. At the time of his deportation, Sheikh Ahmed Baba had one of the largest libraries in Timbuktu. This is the home of Sheikh Ahmed Baba as Sudani one of the most famous scholars of Timbuktu and a name that is being remembered all throughout the world. Ahmed Baba spent years in captivity in the north, but he never forgot his home in Timbuktu and he never forgot his responsibility to knowledge. Although many of Sheikh Ahmed Baba's books were taken to Morocco, his legacy in Timbuktu lives on through a documentation center set up in 1967 by UNESCO. Ahmed Baba Sudani a étudié en Afrique exclusivement dans sa ville natale sans avoir cherché de professeur ailleurs et quand il a été déporté avec cette culture qu'il a reçu dans sa ville natale il était de très loin les meilleurs des savants de Marrakech et même de l'Afrique du Nord. Si on restitue La maison des professeurs de son corée, dont Ahmed Baba Soudani, on ne rend pas service à Tombouctou seulement ou au Mali, mais à toute l'Afrique, voire toute l'humanité, parce que ces grands savants qui vont sortir de là vont exploiter les milliers et des milliers de manuscrits qui se trouvent à Tombouctou pour le bien de l'humanité tout entière. Par rapport à son temps, personne n'a défendu l'Afrique. Personne n'a défendu le noir plus qu'Ahmed Baba. On a tout fait pour qu'il accepte d'être marocain. Il a refusé et il a continué à s'appeler Ahmed Baba Soudani, Ahmed Baba le noir, Ahmed Baba Tombouctou, Ahmed Baba de Tombouctou. Les gens qui étaient les professeurs avaient des bibliothèques privées. Ils étaient extrêmement documentés. Et la bibliothèque ne renferme pas seulement des livres de théologie ou bien autres, mais des livres d'astronomie, de philosophie, de mathématiques, de physique, de chimie, toutes les connaissances de l'époque. C'était vraiment le quartier de l'intelligentsia tomboxi. The Ahmed Baba Center has become the focal point of the revival and documentation of the manuscripts of Timbuktu. In 2002, South African President Thabo Mbeki visited the city and was so impressed by what he saw 
that he set about making the preservation of the manuscripts a presidential project. This center that we are at now is called the Ahmed Baba Center. The spirit is that of a great scholar who spent his life in pursuit of knowledge and preservation of Islamic heritage. This center, which was founded in 1967, has expanded to the point where it houses over 120,000 manuscripts. Today, um, the city is at a crossroads. Modernization is coming into the city and it is changing the lifestyle within Timbuktu. The scholars are hanging on to the scholarship. They are bringing forth the documents and, and, and trying to let the younger generation uh, see that they have a great tradition. They should be proud of themselves, proud of being Africans, proud of being Muslims, and not ashamed of their color, not ashamed of their identity. But of course, modernization, globalization is striking Timbuktu as it is striking the rest of the world. So the, the scholars are now in a struggle to try to, to, to bring Timbuktu into the modern world, to digitize their libraries, to use modern technology, but at the same time keep that spirit from the ancient world, from Timbuktu when it had reached such a high level uh, within West Africa. The state of the books uh, really is in crisis. The weather um, has deteriorated the texts. Also the termites, beetles, are eating away from the paper and eating at the different bindings. And so literally it is a race you know, to preserve that knowledge that was left from the past. And so scholars are coming forward, families are coming forward and realizing you don't have to give away your treasure. Now a picture can be taken and then we can categorize this, we can preserve the picture and then they can preserve their text. And also um, what is being done is that documentation centers are being developed where the actual texts themselves can be preserved in an air-conditioned climate um, and they can be treated in such a way that the, 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 the materials can be preserved for coming generations. In his speech, I am an African, President Mbeki talks about making the 21st century the African century. These words carry deep meaning, but it's not only to the future we need to look. Africa's past legacy speaks volumes for itself. The first universities in the world as well as many inventions can be attributed to the pioneers of Africa. Timbuktu had its own chapter within this history. When I first laid eyes on Sankore University, I imagined the thousands of students who graduated from here. Timbuktu is hot. In fact, it is unbearably hot. With temperatures reaching 50 degrees Celsius, one has to wonder what made them come here and what made them stay. The prophetic saying, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, acted as one of the wisdoms for the students at Senkore. They were spurred on by their Islamic beliefs and excelled in medicine, astronomy, theology, Islamic law, and a host of other subjects. Uh, six years ago, we discovered a manuscript dealing with mathematics, and it's, de it, it's dealing with algebra. We translate it into French, we send it to Paris to know the level. As a result, the same program is given nowadays at the second year of mathematics school in France. And that manuscript or that program was given here at the University of saint Corée by the 16th century. Now, when we deal with Islamic scholarship, you deal with the concept of fatwa. And a fatwa is a religious decision that meets uh, special needs in a special environment. So therefore, for instance, when decisions had to be made about currency, how much should we charge for gold, or should we tax you know, the, the travelers, they would go to Timbuktu and ask the scholars, give us a fatwa. When they wanted to decide between 
um, borderlines of empires, they would ask for a fatwa in Timbuktu. The scholars in Timbuktu were also known as peacemakers. Whenever there was a difficulty in different parts of the world, uh, of the West, West African world, they would go to the area and they would make peace. Timbuktu became a, a pinnacle of knowledge and a sort of grand court, a supreme justice, where the, the ultimate decisions could be made for the kings and where at the same time a common person could find a scholar and have a religious decision made. Islam by its very nature encourages people to read. The first revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad was Iqra. Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who has created. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him actually said al-hikmah dalatul mu'min that wisdom, knowledge is the lost property of a believer. Anywhere he finds it, he is the most deserving of it. Islam benefited humanity in that um, it gave a type of tawhidic, a unified approach to creation and a unified approach to knowledge. So Islam then unifies the concept of one God. It unifies the human race. So black, white, brown and yellow all see each other as part of one family. Also, there's a type of tawhid or unity in knowledge. So Muslims were able to gather the knowledge of people from all different societies, put it together in the light of their understanding of one God, and then develop a system, algebra, calculus, trigonometry, came out of that unified approach. The scientific method, the concept used by the world today to approach science, was actually developed by Muslims in the Golden Age. Even though there's a good documentation process, some families choose to hang on to their own private collections. In some cases, the books are not taken care of properly and some very important works may be lost. Other private libraries, however, take great pride in the works they have and go to great lengths to maintain them. I visited the Mahmoud Kati Library, where I was pleasantly surprised at the condition of the place. One of the most unique collections of manuscripts in Timbuktu is the Sheikh Mahmoud Kati collection. This was based upon the connection between Andalusia and Spain and West Africa, whereby the great-grandfather of this family migrated from Andalusia in the 15th century and married the daughter of Askio Muhammad Tore, the great leader of the Songhai Empire. Their son, Mahmoud Kati, became a great scholar and wrote Tariq al-Fatash, one of the most important histories of Timbuktu and of West Africa. This collection is now available to the public. The family has come together and gathered uh, their works and they are showing it to the public. And it is now one of the most important and unique collections of Arabic manuscripts in this city. Alors, euh, je vous avoue que notre collection, c'est une collection privée. Mais ça n'a pas d'importance. Et tout le monde islamique d'Afrique peut bien profiter de notre collection et ils peuvent venir trouver leur savoir dont il y a des siècles que c'était fermé et aujourd'hui vraiment que la porte elle est ouverte à tout le monde et tout le monde peut venir consulter ces documents. Comme je le disais tantôt, il y a des traités de science, donc le savoir scientifique en terre arabe, en terre d'islam est là. Le savoir historique en terre d'islam est là. Et la magie, vraiment la logique, les mathématiques, tout le savoir dont les hommes de culture ont besoin est dans notre collection et ce n'est fermé à personne. Le monde africain peut venir consulter ces documents et travailler avec nous, avec les possibilités et les moyens que nous avons. Mmh. 
after the Ahmed Baba Center, probably the most well-known center for the collection of documentation is the Mama Haidara Memorial Library. Mama Haidara himself was one of the most well-known collectors of manuscripts in the Timbuktu area. And he left a very large responsibility to his young son, Abdul Qadir, who was 17 at the time of the death of his father. Abdul Qadir, since that time, has been able to collect over 12,000 documents for the Ahmed Baba Center and then establish his own memorial library for his father and his previous generations and for all those who have collected these manuscripts in the Timbuktu area. منذ إلى حفيد الأسفل وهي عبد القادر مما حيدر والمكتبة هي قديمة جدا والمخطوطات هي قديمة جدا منذ في القرن السادس عشر والمخطوطات لها فوائد كثيرة غير هذا الفائدة الأول وهي محافظة التراث Timbuktu's fame became international, partly due to the ruler of Mali, Mansa Musa. In the 14th century, Mansa Musa undertook a journey that was to become legendary in the annals of history. Pilgrimage to Mecca is encumbered on any Muslim, but when Mansa Musa embarked on his pilgrimage to Mecca, he crossed West Africa and the Sahara Desert with up to 72,000 followers. Timbuktu was also very important for the rulers of the region because it represented uh, the intellectual capital. Mansa Musa uh, was one of the great kings of the empire of Mali. The premier uh, producer of gold and exporter of gold in the world. So naturally the kings of Mali were considered to be uh, some of the richest people on the face of the planet Earth. Mansa Kankan Musa in the year 1324 set out to make his pilgrimage to Mecca. But what was different about his journey is that he carried somewhere between 60 to 72,000 followers with him. He carried 15,000 camels laden with gold and many soldiers and they, they literally changed the economy of every country that they reached. He not only came back with his followers, but he brought along with him architects, scholars and artisans. It is said that everywhere Mansa Musa stopped, he built a mosque every time he stopped. When he reached Timbuktu, he fell in love with the city. He brought with him an Andalusian architect called Abu Isaac Esaidi, and he paid him a lot of money to build the huge mosque of Jingareber that is nowadays a World Heritage Site. On Mansa Musa's return from pilgrimage, his wish was to visit the city of Timbuktu. When he arrived here, he was astounded at the level of knowledge of the scholars. His gift to the city was the Jingari Bear Mosque. Today, the Jingari Bear Mosque is still the main mosque in Timbuktu, and this is most evident at the Friday Jumu'ah prayer. This is the site of the Jingari Bear Masjid and Masjid al-Kabir. It was founded in 1325. From that time until now, Friday prayers have been held in all of the people of Timbuktu come to this major master. <laughs>
The learning in Timbuktu has not stopped either. All across the town, Islamic schools empower young children through the Qur'an. They still recite, read, and write in Arabic. This is a typical Qur'an school in the Jingare Bear section of Timbuktu. It was founded uh, three generations ago by Sheikh Muhammad Lamin, and his people came out of the Sahara Desert region. And uh, in this tradition, the madrasa continues on with over 120 students. Uh, the students are memorizing the Qur'an. They are all different levels of study. And as part of their um, uh, life as a student, not only do they memorize the Qur'an, but they also work and they uh, prepare their own food and it becomes like a, a community within itself. The women of Timbuktu have always been involved in intensive learning. Today, study circles are popping up all over the city where women receive a complete Islamic education. This is an important development for when you educate a man, you educate an individual, but when you educate a woman, you educate a family. Timbuktu today is special in the sense that Timbuktu flies in the face of myths of racism. It destroys the myth that black people, that African people are ignorant people. It destroys the myth that literacy and science and progress was from the north and it came south. So it flies in the, the, the face of the north-south racist type of concept because this is now knowledge in the south and it is going north as well. Also Timbuktu at its height and you're talking about from the 12th century and then reaching by the 16th century its height. It has a university like Sankode University with over 25,000 students. Now this is long before Sorbonne and before uh, Oxford University, University of London. So at that time Black African people were a pinnacle of knowledge. They were not only studying Islamic subjects in the sense of Quran and Hadith, but they were also studying math, science, medicine, geography, optics. It is said by Asadi in his Tariq al-Sudan uh, that one of his relatives needed to have an eye operation and he went to Jenne, the city of Jenne, and this was actually successful. So they were performing cataract eye operations. And uh, so they reach such a high level uh, of science and astronomy. And so this astronomical knowledge, this mathematical knowledge, um, was you know, on a very high level here in Timbuktu. But one of the areas that is not spoken of so much is the knowledge of spirituality, that knowledge of ihsan. How do you purify your soul? How do you come closer? to the creator of the heavens and the earth. The scholars in Timbuktu and the Sahara region were able to go to a very high level of this spirituality and to actually train people how to clean their souls and how to prepare themselves for death. So Timbuktu is a very important um, meeting place of materials and spiritualism. So it is a place where your materials no longer control you. Your spirituality controls you. Your materials sustain you. And so in that sense, uh, Timbuktu uh, is one of the greatest centers of learning, not only in Africa, but in the world.